The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. Great. Good afternoon. This is a bit of a different talk maybe in this session on proportioning because it has nothing to do with proportioning of limestone cements, but it has to do with the sulfate resistance of concretes that contain significant amounts of limestone in the cements, typically the blended, like the c 595 1L cements in combination with supplementary cementitious materials. And Reza Hani is my PhD student. He's been doing the work on the concrete for the last four or five years, hopefully finishing soon. And uh, I'm just the messenger. Okay. so. C-595, uh, about three or four years ago, allowed the use of up to 15% limestone in, in uh, cements and also in AASHTO M240. Um, it's now currently accepted by 20 state DOTs. There's 12 plants in the U.S. making type 1L cement. Um, the only caveat with that is they're not allowed in moderate or highly sulfate resistant categories within the, the blended cement. And that's because of concerns raised about the potential increased risk for thomasite sulfate attack, which is a mineral that forms at low temperatures and it involves carbonate in the, the product itself. And so it's shown here, it's kind of a complex thing, but um, the sulfates come in, there's carbonates involved in the product, and calcium silicate, there's no aluminates in this thing. So it's not a typical tricalcium aluminate attack, uh, sulfate attack. It attacks the calcium silicate matrix, and if it occurs, it can be quite uh, detrimental. Basically, you lose the cohesive strength of the concrete, so it's not something you want. Um, so we want to know if there is an increased risk with the use of such materials, and it applies equally to limestone fillers in concrete, that same concern. Now, the advantage, of course, to the reason one of the reasons this went forward um, is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, increase sustainability, by allowing up to 15% underground limestone while providing equivalent physical properties. In other words, equivalent setting times, equivalent strength development from one day on um, in the strength development curve. So from a user's point of view, regular concrete, it should be transparent whether it's a 1L cement or a, an ASTM type 1 cement. And it reduces energy because you need, you're not making as much clinker, cement clinker, which is the main greenhouse gas emission, but it's also one of the high energy ends of the cement production process. The concern is this low temperature thing. In Canada, we allowed these cements, an equivalent type of cement, back in 2008. Um, we've been doing research on this issue because it was a concern when we approached the subject of sulfate attack, uh, the increased uh, risk of sulfate attack. We've been doing research for about 10 years on this in a number of studies, uh, including um, uh, mortar bars as well as concrete, and this is the concrete part of the study I'm going to present. The Canadian standard since last year now allows the use of limestone cements with SEMs in sulfate exposures in concrete. Uh, that's based on, but we've still got some sort of belts and suspenders thrown in there at the moment. Minimum amount of levels of SEMs. We have a mortar bar test that's run at low temperature and you have to pass that test. And we're saying you need to use a 0.40 water cement ratio, which is equivalent to the most severe category of sulfate exposure for all sulfate exposures. So at this point, we're now allowing it in, but we've still got some caveats on its use because there's a, I guess, a lack of comfort level by some of the producers with its use in severe sulfate exposures. Now in the States, this is where the main sulfate concerns are. I mean, of course, there's concerns around the coastal areas with moderate sulfate uh, attack in, 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 uh, from seawater, but mainly it's pretty much everything west of the Mississippi has sulfates in it uh, of some sort or other. Um, the only negligible areas are the clear areas on that graph. So this is a map where sulfates are of concern. Colorado's right in there. Um, and so that's why it's a significant issue with respect to its use. Now sulfate attack, people typically learn in school that tricalcium aluminate um, is susceptible to attack. The sulfates come in, you form a later age etronite, which causes expansion and cracking. Uh, but it's not that simple. There's many forms of sulfate attack, and there's physical salt attack or sulfate attack depending on how people define it. 
which has to do with evaporative transport and phase changes of sulfate salts, typically sodium sulfate salts, in the water as water evaporates and you go through temperature and humidity changes and it causes like almost like a freeze thaw attack by growth of these crystals in the pores and it causes a progressive raveling of concrete where there's buildup of these salts. And then there's the Thomasite thing. Portland limestone cements have no known impact on the first two. Our concern where we put the reservations in on the, in the spec for C595 were mainly based about the Thomasite one because it contains carbonate. Now there's an example of uh, traditional sulfate attack. That's, that's a type 5 Portland cement concrete after uh, 20 years in sulfate solution. It's not sulfate proof, it's sulfate resistant, it's damaged, but it's a lot better the shape than the type 2 cement and the type 1 cement doesn't even exist anymore in that same setup. Um, this is what I mean by physical salt attack. And it's typically seen in arid environments where you're getting wicking of sulfate salts up through the, from the foundation with moisture. The water evaporates just above grade leaves the salts behind and goes through phase changes for temperature and humidity and it ravels away the concrete. That can be remedied by using lower water cement ratio concrete for the most part because you basically interrupt the pathway for that evaporation. So we're not talking about that but this is Thomasite sulfate attack. This was on a uh, foundations for a bridge in the UK that made a lot of news about 10 years ago or so and you can dig this concrete out with your hand and there is somebody and, um, and again, had nothing to do with limestone cements um, um, in the concrete, but it formed because of the, the cold, wet environment that occurred there. And the end game, if you take a concrete sample and you get the right conditions, that's what happens to your concrete um, in there. So again, it's, it's triggered by soluble carbonates, a lot of sulfates, and low temperatures and lots of water if it happens. So we want to find out, is this a concern? And these dissolved sulfate species can come from anything. In fact, the, a lot, most of the cases have been reported in Europe, they're coming from groundwaters, the car dissolved carbonates in, in, uh, in groundwaters as opposed to anything in the concrete materials. Um, so it's not just the concrete materials, but we're trying to find out whether we have an increased risk. So that was the purpose of this exercise. Um, and of course, in, when you want to evaluate concrete, because we originally developed a mortar bar test based on the ASTM C1012, a low temperature version, and that's what we develop, developed before, um, that would can trigger Thomasite if you get the right conditions and the right materials. But the concrete people in our standards committee in Con Canada said, you know, mortar bars are fine, but what about concrete? So we embarked on a concrete program. The problem is there's no standard test anywhere in the world for sulfate resistance of concrete. Typically what we do in 318 is you specify the cementitious materials and then you specify concrete quality in terms of minimum strength, maximum water cement ratio in the concrete. And that's how you make sulfate resistant concrete. But there's no concrete test. So we did that. We were trying to develop one um, uh, for this project. Um, so we looked at a number of combinations and we're also trying to investigate um, whether we need, how much do we need in terms of supplementary cementitious materials and is the limestone really an issue. So we made some concretes. Back in 2010, we started off with 53 concrete mixtures at three water cement ratios, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.7. We used a series of type one Portland cements, which we call GU up in Canada. Um, with nine, with zero percent, nine percent, ten percent and a half percent, and fifteen percent underground limestone, we used five types of type five cements or HS cements here, two types of moderate sulfate or type two cements. We used a blended highly sulfate resistant cement with fly ash that's produced now, um, and used in the field. And of course, then we added to all these cements, the the, the type one cements. We added slag, silica fume, metakill, and fly ash combinations. We ran lab prisms at five degrees Celsius in a series of refrigerators. I keep buying refrigerators. I've now got enough refrigerators to hold over a thousand concrete prisms. Um, I won't have any lab space soon. Um, and we built an outdoor exposure site, which I call the tomb, because it looks like a tomb. We now have almost a thousand concretes out in there. We made a lot of strength specimens. Uh, we've done other quality tests like rapid chloride permeability and resistivity 
familiar with Breck properties. Uh, my student tells me how hard working he is because he made all these concretes. Um, and in two, so that's the ten, that, these are the mixtures we did in 2010. Uh, then a type one cement with different replacements of supplementaries, the 9% limestone cement with 40 and 50 slag. Because in Ontario, we mainly use slag as a supplementary. Uh, and then we use 15% limestone cement, which is right on the limit. Um, so the whole series of combinations of materials. We tested some sulfate resistant cements and that blended cement I mentioned. Those were at 0.4. We then made a bunch of concretes at 0.5 water cement ratio. A number of them duplicating the cementitious mixtures. In 2011 and 2012, we made a bunch of 0.7 water cement ratio. Not that you would do that in practice, because you're not allowed to, um, according to the code. We wanted to see if you've made a porous concrete, are these things more susceptible? We're just trying to accelerate things. Then we cast a bunch more mixes with some more sulfate resistant cements and another limestone cement back in 2012. And then this year, we cast 27 more concretes with a, a wider series of combinations of materials. Again, expanding the database in concrete. Um, we selected for the 0.4 water cement ratios 15,000 parts per million sodium sulfate, because that corresponds to the worst case scenario in Western Canada in field sampling that, uh, in Alberta, which is not far. I think there's some cases that are worse in the US uh, that go a little higher than that, but it's, it, it's pretty severe. It's well into the S3 category in uh, 318. Um, so we have sand, concretes in lime water as controls, sodium sulfate and magnesium sulfate, because they're the two principal sulfates you find in the field. And for the high 0.4 concretes, we use this higher limit amount, as I mentioned, which corresponds to the S3 category. For the higher water cement ratios, we use 1,500 parts per million, which is right at the boundary between S1 and S2 exposures. The outdoor tomb varied, which is supposed to simulate what you would see in foundations, which is where the concern is here, varied between 3 and 16 Celsius, or 37 to 61 Fahrenheit. And every year we go out and measure the length change, the mass change, and do visuals on this. And I'm mainly going to show you the visuals, because with concrete, because they're thick enough, it's hard to get length change in a reasonable time frame. They can deteriorate on the outside and still not expand. Mass change is a little more when they start to deteriorate a little more uh, sensitive than length change. Um, now there's building the tomb. We use recycled concrete blocks to build the tomb uh, in this thing. It's eight feet deep, and we then put containers in it, and then we loaded the beams into it, and then we put the sulfate solutions into it. And so they're hand bombing it in. That's Reza, my graduate student in the bottom there, uh, the slaves. and. Uh, we labeled them with uh, brass pins with labels because anything on the surface, if they deteriorate, it's going to disappear. So we did that just so we knew what they were if they did deteriorate. And so we've got them in the different solutions in the cave. And Mike Thomas at the University of New Brunswick has got a similar amount of concretes in a similar exposure with an another range of materials that, uh, in this. So every year we hand bomb them out take them back to the lab, condition them at room temperature so you can measure length change on a consistent basis for a day or so, and then we measure, take the length measurements, uh, mass measurements, and take photos. That's the typical, we've got, a data, we've got a thermocouples in the site, so we know the temperature history down below in, the, in this tube, and it varies from about three or four Celsius, just in the low 40s, so I guess that'd be high 30s, and then of course in the summer it warms up and down below. We've got four feet of foam insulation to try and mitigate the temperature a bit. But this is typically what you would see in foundations, footings, in buildings, at least in our neck of the woods. Okay. So every year we, we get them out, we look at them. This is a particularly bad case where they've deteriorated. You can see that and we rinse them off with water before we weigh them. And we save the bits in a, on a sieve. And then we, we uh, take the measurements and then put them back in. Okay. So. I'm going to show you some photographs of the conditions of some of these things. My student has created a, a, uh, a scale. I guess green means good and red means the worst case. So he's got undamaged, minimal, moderate, moderate, severe, and severe. Or he's got them numerically graded from 0 to 5. It's the right number scale. And these are just example photos of what he considers that uh, each of those conditions. 
and severe means the whole surface is gone and you're starting to lose the corners. The coarse aggregates are starting to come loose. So that is severe. There, these things are now up to five years old. Um, some of them are only three years old and some are less than that. I'm going to show you some five and three year ones. So here's a straight type, GU is type one cement. Um, so that is a straight type one cement with 40% slag replacement. It's showing some small damage at the corners after five years at 0 0.40 water cement ratio. There's a 9% limestone cement with the same amount of slag, it looks a bit worse, but then with the 50% slag, it's not damaged at all. It's completely undamaged. The 15% limestone cement has very minimal damage. It's very comparable to the straight Portland that would be allowed now in sulfate exposures. And with 50%, there's no damage as well. Um, this type one cement has 12% C3A clinker, so it represents a worst case scenario of, of type one cement at least for the cements that are made in Canada. Um, this type 9% limestone cement was a bit problematic because we got a trial grind done on a plant. This was done back when they were just introducing the product and they didn't, we didn't have the resu strength results when we used it in the study because of timing considerations and it turns out this cement wasn't optimized to give equal strength. So it's a bit of a, uh, an outlier and that's not surprising that it didn't perform quite as well this 15% now there's a type five cement, and it's showing in that same time frame, lo complete loss of pace in that same environment in this sulfate exposure in the outdoor tanks underground. So it's performing worse than a straight type one with slag. That doesn't surprise me based on all our mortar bar C1012 results. Um, and there's the commercially available blended cement that is used in Western Canada with 30% of an F ash with a type, basically a type two clinker. And it's showing about the same response as the 40% slag with the type one clinker after five years. Okay, this is a different limestone cement that's only three years old. Uh, uh, Ten and a half percent limestone, 40% slag, 50% slag. Uh, gets better when you add more slag. There's no damage whatsoever there. The, these are two different type of five cements that are in use. Um, one of them is from the US, one's from Canada and they're showing about the same response as that one in terms of field condition um, at this point of three years. So what we're seeing here, and that's the reason I put, because we, we didn't have a benchmark. Our benchmark is what's allowed now in the field for sulfate exposures. So our benchmark is type five cements are currently allowed in the field and type um, other types of cement, if they're qualified by mortar bar testing are allowed with supplementary cementitious materials so those are our benchmarks for what's good enough because we know that we haven't had any real problems in the last 75 or 80 years in the field with type 5 cements at 0.4 water cement ratio or with the uh, with lesser time with the SEM and normal cement. So our comparison for the limestone cements is always our benchmark is what, what's being used now. And we're seeing that we can get equal or better performance than what's being used now. So here's some type 2 cements. Um, so slag versus type two. So the type twos are on the right. Uh, type two cement and then one with uh, some limestone in it. There's a straight Portland cement with slag, 9% uh, with slag. This is at five years at a 0.5 water cement ratio with a lower concentration, only 1,500 parts per million, would be why it doesn't look as severe. Um, and there's 15% limestone, 30 slag. There's no difference there. They're completely undamaged in that lower concentration at 0.5 water cement ratio. But the type two moderate sulfate cement, which would be allowed there, is showing severe damage at this point in time. So they're performing better regardless of the limestone. Um, and the same thing with more slag um, in the system. Now this is sort of a time lapse thing. We're showing the condition of the same beams at one year, two years, two and a half years, almost four years, and almost five years showing what's going on in terms of condition. If you can just can't see the details, but you can see the color code. So it was undamaged at one year. This is a straight Portland cement with 40 slag, minimal damage. It isn't progressing through the rest of the time frame. Here's that 50% slag with the 15% limestone cement, completely undamaged from start to finish over five years. Here's a, um, uh, a sulfate resistant Portland cement, undamaged at one year, but it's getting worse with time in that same uh, scenario. And here's another 
uh, this blended cement, which is a type 2 plus 30 percent fly ash, which is used as a type 5 equivalent, um, again, showing minor damage that isn't progressing. So the SEM mixes are showing pretty good performance here. The one that's showing the worst performance is the one people tend to use, which is the type 5 cement. Again, here's some at two and a half years with the, um, uh, the different limestone cement. Here's a 25% fly ash, 40 slag. Um, on its own, the limestone cement, of course, doesn't perform well. A high C3A cement with no SEMs is not going to perform well. And, but we're seeing minimal damage here. But if we increase the fly ash and F ash from 25 to 30, we take that damage down to zero. And we take the slag from 40 to 50, we get the damage down to zero after that time frame. Um, again, here's some more uh, type 5 cement. This is just rehashing some of the things you may have seen. Here's a type 5 Portland cement after five years. There's that same cement with added amounts of lime. Uh, that one is 5% limestone um, and then 10% limestone. That's the same clinker with different amounts of limestone. They're all not doing very well. That's the blended cement with 30% fly ash. Type 5 equivalent, and here's the two other type 5s, but they're in the early days. Just to compare uh, the sulfate resistance systems. Okay. Now, this is at 0.7 water cement ratio. Even with the lower concentration of sulfates, um, even though you shouldn't use 0.7, even at that ratio, this shows a highly sulfate resistant. That's a type 5 cement at 0.7 water cement ratio, which gets to the point is. Type 5 cement on its own doesn't make sulfate resistant concrete. You've got to make good quality concrete. It's not a surprise, but you might be surprised at the level of damage of those beams uh, after less than four years. So, um, and these are all in the, um, these four are in the same lower sulfate environment. So the, well, what happened to my kettle? Um, okay, so we'll carry on. The, um, again, here's some, the, the 0.4 water cement ratio, the fly ash with different amounts of fly ash. Uh, um, 25 and 30 fly ash versus the sulfate resistant blended cement with 30% fly ash. So we're just comparing the fly ash mixes that we had data for, showing their potential. And the limestone plus the 30% fly ash is performing better than the lower C3A clinker with 30% flash that's underground that's sold now. Okay. Silica fume, great performance, 8% silica fume. There's a ternary mix with sl uh, 25 slag and 6 silica fume, which is typically what we're using for high performance concrete in the Toronto area. Uh, there's a limestone cement with 8% uh, silica fume again, same performance. And here's one with the ternary blend uh, with silica fume and slag. 15% limestone cement. We're not seeing any impact in that concrete, uh, but I guess the permeability of these concretes is going to be very low. Okay, metakaolin mixes. These are the mixture. These are up 0.4. Those two on the right are up 0.5 in a lower concentration. Again, we're seeing minimal amount of damage unless you, with the slag and metakaolin, we're doing well. <coughs> metakaolin on its own didn't do quite as well. Um, whether it had limestone or not. And, but if you added some slag with the medicaline, um, uh, then it worked well. Okay. It's, uh, I'm getting towards the end of this. I know it's hard to see these things, but uh, that's why we have the color codes on there. Hopefully you can see by the color. Um, this shows um, sodium versus magnesium. So there's the type one cement and sodium sulfate versus mag sulfate at four and a half years. There's the 40% slag with that type 1 cement and sodium or magnesium. There's um, the highly uh, type 5 cement on the right, uh, sodium and magnesium. And um, the 15% limestone, sodium, magnesium. 50% slag, sodium, magnesium. No damage here with the limestone cement and 50 slag, but we are seeing damage with magnesium. So the magnesium is more severe. <coughs> and we're seeing that a number of things. That blended cement that is sold with 30% flash, the same story. So we're seeing higher levels of severity in most cases with, with magnesium sulfate. 
and that's well known because the pH is lower, you tend to cause other chemical interactions with magnesium sulfate. Okay, so what do we draw from all these pictures? Um, of course, high C3A type 1 cements are not sulfate resistant. No, that's a no-brainer, um, whether they have limestone or not. And supplementary cementitious materials, slag and fly ash, silica fume, and even metachillin, have greatly improved that resistance to sulfate attack at low temperatures. Um, and if we prevent normal sulfate attack, and I haven't shown you all the data, the x-ray work and other things, if you prevent normal sulfate attack, we're not going to get thomasite sulfate attack. All of our mortar bar data shows that, thermodynamics shows us that, and the concrete is verifying that. Um, the Portland limestone cement SCM binders are performing as well or better than what's currently allowed in terms of type 5 cements or um, HS cements or HSB cements, which are blended highly sulfate cements and the other issue about this type of salt. Just to throw in the thermodynamics, this is work done by Laurent Barcelo et al. It was published in Cement and Concrete Research, and it shows with, if you expose different systems, this is a Portland cement system with increasing limestone and you're exposing to sulfate, the first thing that forms in sulfate attack is etronite, it's the red point here, and you're getting damage to the etronite before thomasite would even occur. So, and that's exactly what we're seeing mortar bars, we've never seen thomasite prior to damage to, um, due to etronite, um, and we're seeing that in the concrete, and this, the thermodynamics would predict that as well, that if you make sulfate-resistant concrete and you don't get damage, then you don't get the thomasite sulfate attack. So and that's what I'm saying in the top point there. Um, and ASTM C1012, even at room temperature, is conservative. Uh, in, in classifying sulfate resistance of cementitious systems. We developed that low temperature test in the Canadian standard because we were moving sort of a, at the head of, leading edge of the curve. We're now thinking of backing off on the need for that low temperature sulfate resistant mortar bar test. Um, and we're hoping to bring that sort of updated knowledge to ASTM um, that we went in because we were sort of leading the way, being very conservative, and now we're, as we get more information, thinking of backing off a bit. Keeping sulfates out of concrete and using good quality concrete as, as required in the building code. And use of SEMs are the main defenses against sulfate damage. And uh, that's saying the same thing as that. If you prevent normal sulfate attack, you'll prevent the thomasite attack, so it becomes a non-issue with the limestone. So that's the end of the game. So thank you. <laughs>